Welcome back to Watches Live. It's the only show here on Watchbox Reviews, and tonight the theme is Grail Watches. I have a broad array from the likes of Rolex, Omega, Patek Philippe, Vacheron, Constantin, and for those of you who like to live large, Hublot. For those of you who don't, Laurent Ferrier, there should be something for everyone on the table tonight. I also want to reach out to our global audience of watch connoisseurs and fans around the world and remind you that tonight will be the last week that we are running our contest for the $2,700 value Bird Vallee Horological Sculpture, a gorgeous composition in luscious lucite, hand-finished. It takes about three weeks to create one of these from start to finish and involves no less than eight hours of autoclaving to stabilize the material. The interior of the skull featuring individual components from watches and clocks reclaimed, ultrasonically cleaned, and hand detailed to bring out the best in their color and texture and character. Crafted by Bird Vallee in its atelier in New York City, you can see the details are excruciatingly and beautifully finished. Achingly gorgeous, right down to the engraved sterling silver plaque on the back of each one. Each one also comes with a broad array of accessories. If you like boxed sets from the watch world, you're gonna love this, as this watch gives you a wonderful handmade and finished wooden cupboard that accompanies it, a leather tote bag, a polishing cloth, certificate of authenticity, and a little bit of background on how these pieces are created. So welcome tonight, our audience from around the world. Let me double check our live chat box here, see who has been first. Remember, first doesn't mean favorite, but I'm always glad to see tonight, uh, Mozart Rabai joining us, Simon Holt from Hollywood North Island, ST3, Boat joining us, Canada the Best from Vancouver, BC, and Matt Forster from Northern Virginia. Jasper, welcome. Okay guys, let's start with a Grail watch by any standard, and this is a great one. This is Laurent Ferrier's Montre École annual calendar. A watch that's only been with us for a little bit over a year. It's a timepiece that combines the Laurent Ferrier Montre École watch case, or the Bassinet case shape, with a annual calendar complication built on Laurent Ferrier's own base movement. Now, if we can get really close to this watch, I want to focus first on the texture and the coloration of the dial. You'll note a gorgeous vertical anthracite satin grain with a circumferential concentric brushed pattern around the hour track, the signature Asagai white spear style hands. It's actually a crosshair dial, if you look closely, with a beautiful transferred lacquer, radial date, gorgeous blue to complement the anthracite, the white, and the red shocks. Now I'm gonna wind this watch up and demonstrate how it operates, and then I'm gonna show you the case back, because there's a lot to say about this piece. Now Laurent Ferrier, of course, a small manufacturer out of Geneva, the principal is a previous Patek Philippe complication specialist, and rest assured, Patek is on the table tonight. But what really sets Laurent Ferry apart is the combination of the avant-garde and the traditional. Avant-garde in style on the dial, traditional in the case shape, and the finishing of the movement. You're gonna be very impressed both by the mechanism and the aesthetics of the movement beneath. So the mechanism allows you to adjust, if you look, the annual calendar, both forward and backwards, with no hazard to the movement. You see me transitioning seamlessly between August and July. Moreover, this being an annual calendar, it only needs to be adjusted once a year during the jump from February to March. Now, turning the watch over, I promised you an impressive movement, and sure enough, here it is. A couple of things set it apart. First, the degree of finishing. Absolutely immaculate with the real Cote de Genève, not the stamped kind, and you can tell because of the texture. They run from light colored on one side to dark on the opposite crest. That's how you know you're looking at the real thing. Now, if you look at the edge of the bridges, you'll also note a beautiful mirrored anglage, perfectly rounded with the same finish. You'll see it rounding out and shining within the jewel countersinks. This is the Laurent Ferrier Caliber 12601. Manual wind with a case back power reserve, 80 hour power reserve, and the bi directional annual calendar complication. You'll also note an even and beautifully tight perlage pattern or engine turning across the base plate. And you'll note that it's two different perlage patterns a tighter one atop the balance and a broader one just below. This is state of the art finishing and in a watch that allows you to buy the horological refinement without paying a precious metal premium. This watch is steel. You also note a pusher adjuster for the day of the week, so you don't need any calendar corrector tools to adjust all of the indications of this annual calendar from Laurent Ferrier. 
Bob Rouleau joining us, Pilot Style 123, Simon Holt, Mason 1, Ryan H, Matt Forster, Hachi, Zenki. Tim, you need some Krators on the show. Hachi, I need someone to send me some Krators. Grand Seiko, we're friends. Send me some Krator. You know I'll give you the good word. All right. Moving on from a watch that represents the best of Geneva present, let's talk about a watch that represents the best of Geneva past. And by past, Let's start with the not-too-distant past. Let's start with the late 90s. A watch known as the 245 among Vacheron Cognoscenti. This is the 47245. This is the day date with retrograding date. This is a watch that came out in the late 1990s, 97, 98, with a gorgeous ivory dial with a beautiful herringbone print that you can just see lightly embossed. You'll also note the rose gold accents perfectly cued to the aesthetic of the watch. Rose gold hands, rose gold indices, rose gold numerals, handsomely matched with that ivory dial base. This is a quintessential Vacheron complication of the modern era, as one of the company's undersold engineering traditions has been the retrograde complication. It's always spectacular, always balanced, and always powered by something truly special underneath the hood. In this case, it's based on a JLC 889 caliber, thin and fine, and executed by JLC for Vacheron. They have a long heritage together, dating back to the 19th century, and in the modern era, JLC was actually a primary stakeholder and administrator of Vacheron from the 1940s through the 1960s. Now, the watch is about 38.5 millimeters in diameter, but it's a strong watch with the characteristic exaggerated lug profiles that have been one of the signatures of Vacheron since at least the 1940s. You can see the step to those lug profiles gives it a visual strength that totally belie the actual proportions of this very wearable watch. And I think it's probably for the best that I show you the watch on the wrist, because when I talk about the size of a watch and the versatility of the watch, the proportions of the watch, it's really for the best that I demonstrate on a smaller wrist, because let's face it, not all of us are He-Man, not all of us are Dwayne Johnson, some of us have 16 centimeter wrists, and I'm actually part of that party. So take a look at this watch on the wrist about 38.5 millimeters, you can see it has impressive presence without being overbearing. I don't love colored gold, but I have to say that rose gold would be my preference over yellow, and colored gold in general works better on a watch of traditional proportions. This is Vacheron at its finest, always one of the best of the etablisseur, those assembling the best dials, the best cases, the best movements. This is consistent with the company's heritage and proof positive that you do not need a manufacturer movement to offer quality and make a statement. Absolutely gorgeous. VC, Vacheron, you have a wonderful history together. That said, from the realm of non-manufacture movements, LaMagna and Omega, though often corporate cousins, are not precisely the same company. Nevertheless, in the wake of the 1969 Apollo 11 moon landing, they came together to do something quite special, and this is about as special as it gets. This is the BA145022. I promised you Grail watches in this episode, and I'm going to deliver yellow gold Speedmaster Professional Moon Watch. Now, 1,014 of these were created in the wake of the original moon landing, the first 32 of which went to VIPs, many of whom were government officials, such as President Richard Nixon, who, for political reasons, had to decline the gift and were not able to accept. Their loss is your gain, as many of these find their ways into the collections of truly elite collectors. A solid gold dial with gold indices and hands. The watch features a rich red tachymeter bezel. And you'll note, on the case back, and this is actually the third series, there were a couple of these, starting with a relatively shallow, and you'll note it's also unfinished. If we can get a little closer, guys, get as close as possible here. Starting with a fairly shallow engraving, the second generation went to a deep engraving, and the third generation, which you see here, was deeply engraved with red lacquer. Omega Speedmaster 1969 Apollo 11, the first watch worn on the moon, and you'll note the individual numbering just below on the moon out of the original 1014. This is a very special watch. Now that we're close halt, let's take a look at that solid gold dial. You'll note it has a pronounced vertical satin grain to it, and it is immaculate, untouched and gorgeous. The only marks you're looking at are those of the plexiglass crystal atop. You'll also note that the lugs are beautiful, full, fluid, 
perfectly defined. You'll note the transition between the satin and the polished elements is seamless. This is a watch minimally, if ever refinished, exceptionally rare. This is the definition of a grail, powered by the Omega slash LaMagna caliber 18 or 861 in this era, back when it was still a 17 joule movement. 21,600 vibrations per hour, 48 hour power reserve. But trust me, the tech specs are less important with this particular iteration. And I can see Jesper saying, that's not an everyday watch. True, unless you've walked on the moon, in which case you would have earned it. I will say this, if you're looking for an everyday watch and something that's got a little bit of a flyboy heritage like the Omega Speedmaster, but perhaps a little bit more discreet, not quite as hyper-precious, rare, and almost instantly investment grade, which that watch, watch was right out of the factory, consider a discontinued sporting Rolex from the uncommon and hallowed Turnograph family. Now, in 1953, the original Rolex Turnograph 6202, let's get as close as we can, guys, beat the Rolex Submariner to market by a few months. Now, aside from the basically series production prototype zero graph of the 30s, this was the first serially produced rotating bezel Rolex, bi-directional rotating pilot style bezel. By the mid 1950s, it had been adopted as standard issue by the US Air Force Thunderbirds Aerobatic Demonstration Squadron, one of the rare cases of the military giving its pilots Rolex watches. By the late 1950s, it had joined the Datejust family rather than standing alone as a reference in its own right. And in 2011, the series was discontinued altogether. Never a common watch, these last generation best of breed turnographs are among the most sought. You'll note the date disc is all red. It's not roulette every single day. Unlike the roulette, which alternates black and red, every single day on the date disc is red. You'll also note the shock of red at six o'clock for the name, as well as the Lancet style seconds hand. But what really sets this one apart is that it uses a matte white dial. We're familiar with gloss Rolex dials and sunburst metallic dials in the modern era. The appearance of a true gloss or matte finished white not silver, but white, is exceptionally uncommon amongst modern Rolex. And this is another watch that is for those who are a little bit inside baseball. Let's say you like Rolex, you appreciate the heritage and the unimpeachable integrity of the product quality, but you don't like the fact that they tend to be lookalikes and everyone has one. Well, guess what? No one else in the office is gonna have a turnograph. Let's put this one on the wrist and take a look. My wrist again, 16 centimeters for those who don't commonly watch my shows. Also, those who may not have seen my watch reviews, but my wrist is representative of a smaller guy's wrist. Oval in profile, flat across the top. You can see how a 36 millimeter date just wears, and I actually think this is the perfect size. If you're gonna go two-tone, two-tone is a bit of an 80s and 90s look. As a result, it wears better, more organically, on a watch with an 80s or 90s size, and back then, oversized was not the thing. 36 was a robust men's style back then, and if history is any guide, since the 1940s, 36 has been an enduring and timeless Rolex case size. So not only does this one have the 80s and 90s working for it, it also has the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Rotating bezel, Rolex turnograph, six digit, 116263. This is one of the last of the breed. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about your Grail watches. Now this is something we talked about in our, our last broadcast, our last live broadcast on Monday, and I was gonna read off as many Grail watches from the live chat as I could. So let me know, what is your Grail watch? Feed it to me and I'll do my best to report faithfully. I can see right here, bump, 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 bump. I can see Hachi Zenki saying, Grail watch, untouched root beer bezel, nipple dial GMT master. For good measure, why not throw in Concord hands? And I have a question from Jesper asking, that watch was for sale? Every watch you see here is for sale. Um, and then we have Fjord Prefect asking if there are defined edges on the fluted bezel. Uh, yeah, it is factory, and I think you need to take another look at it, because this is one of the better preserved examples I've seen. I think the problem is that we have a relatively distant camera, and if you want to see the fluting of the bezel, it's the kind of thing that's best displayed by moving it relative to the light. You only get the gem-like facets of the fluted bezel when you turn it more or less flat and then turn it against the studio light, but you can see that this is a very sharply defined bezel. This has not been refinished, and you can see the lacquer inserts in the numerals attesting to that. The lacquer tends to go when these are refinished. The lacquer here is wonderfully intact, and you can see it's deep and it's dark. 
Okay. I can see Richard Greenberg saying his grail is a steel Daytona. Pilot Style saying Patek Philippe Aquanaut. Ryan H. Jacques Dro Eclipse Perpetual Calendar. Well, I don't have a perpetual calendar on the table tonight other than the one that I own, which is right here. But I do have a rather intriguing simple watch with a calendar complication. And until 1998, the only complication in the Patek Philippe Nautilus family was the date. So this is the watch that everyone considers a grail today. This is the Nautilus in steel, reference 5711-1A. This is the blue gradient dial, a watch with gravitas, presence, history, heritage, rarity, all of that and versatility going for it. About a 40 millimeter case, though you have to exclude the winglets. What set the 2006 to present model, the 5711 apart from previous, was the dramatic gradient shading of the dial, which starts as silver blue at center and fades to a black navy at the periphery. White gold indices, white gold baton style hands, Beautifully discreet and actually quite compact on the wrist. It is a very thin watch. I'm going to put this one on the wrist and give you a better sense of it because this is a special reference. It's got a fit, a feel, a presence that requires no, no size, no heft, no gold, no complications. This is a watch that declares itself with elegance. On my 16 centimeter wrist, it wears easily. You can see the the sparkle of that metallic gradient dial, and also the coherence of it. Gerald Genta, to the day he died, declared himself to be a jewelry designer, not a designer of watches. And you can see the family resemblance in this one. The integration of bezel, case, winglets, lugs, and bracelet, as well as the contrasting satin and polished finish, all speaks to a sensibility born of the jewelry segment, adapted, somewhat grudgingly, I may add, to watch design. Genta envisioned this watch as a riposte to his own 1972 Audemars Piguet Royal Oak. So in this bout in 1976, it was not derivative of the Royal Oak, it was Genta aiming to surpass himself. And if resale values and secondary market prices are any sign of success, Genta succeeded. Now, one of the hallmarks of the 5711, that is the, the 2006 30th anniversary model to present, is the display case back. And uh, sorry, I got to do this to you again, Harrison, but we're going back to the macro, or at least our close in. We don't quite have the macro yet. We're working on it. But you can see the caliber 324 center rotor automatic. In the original jumbo, you would not have had the ability to see the movement, though it was Geneva seal finished. Here you can see that this is one of the later examples with the Patek Philippe seal, meaning it also features in this iteration, which I verified, the Spiromax silicon hairspring for anti-magnetism. Absolutely gorgeous, and yet it doesn't compromise the watertight integrity of the watch. You can see the watch still boasts the same 120 meter water resistance thanks to its screw down crown and tight case construction as the original monoblock Nautilus. So this is everything the historic watch was, plus the ability to see your movement, plus the gradient dial. Now, I'll also say that there have been many efforts since the 70s to one-up both Gerald Genta's Royal Oak and his Nautilus, and a contemporary repost was the 222 by Vacheron Constantin, often attributed to Genta, though actually executed by a young Jörg Heisig. That watch served as an inspiration for Vacheron's enduring foray into sports watches, starting in 96 with the Overseas, but in 2004, VC released what became the definitive Overseas. To this day, still the most beloved variant, at least aesthetically. The Generation 2 chronograph, the reference 49150, thanks to its Handsome dial and double-digit date has been a definitive Vacheron reference of the modern era. 42 millimeters, but thanks to a very close cropped set of lugs, only about 50.6 millimeters lug to lug, this is a, a borderline oversized sports watch that wears nice and trim and compact. Now you'll note the bracelet, and this is where having the hardware in hand really pays off. When you get really close to the bracelet of the Vacheron and the bracelet of the Patek, you'll note that the Vacheron actually features a little bit more depth and detailing. If you look at the way that Maltese cross motif is first cast and then finished into the individual links, there's a lot more going on than you see on the Patek. Vacheron one-upping Patek at its own game, and that's just the beginning. The Vacheron is also more water resistant. 150 meters versus 120, what's the difference? You're never gonna dive that deep. It's about reserve capacity. That watch that hasn't been water tested in a few months 
months, you want more water resistance to begin with because the 150 ebbs to 50, the 120 ebbs to 30. All of that's important when considering daily use of a watch that's going to get wet on a regular basis. You want to have that reserve water resistance. Now what the watch also has going for it is a gorgeous dial that's got a little bit of calculated quirk. You can note that the register for minutes is larger than chronograph hours and constant seconds. That was a smart measure that makes the watch more readable and practical as a chronograph. Frederic Piguet 1185 with Vacheron's double digit date complication. It is a thin, fine, automatic column wheel version vertical clutch chronograph, not modular like you'll find on the Royal Oak Offshores, integrated. And you can see the chronograph pushers in line with the crown to prove it. Also a robustly anti-magnetic watch with a soft iron inner cage. That said, we can do even a little bit better. We look back from the 2000s with the Overseas and the Nautilus all the way back to the 1950s with a watch that we shared briefly last week, but I really feel I need to elaborate. Patek Philippe referenced 2526 with a Tiffany co-signed Generation 1 enamel dial. This is a special watch. 35.6 millimeters. You can see it has a beautifully domed plexiglass. The watch is actually about 11.7 millimeters thick, so not super slim, but you'll note the significant presence of the horizontally opposed double-facing Patek Philippe Twin P logo. This is the original crown, and you'll note in the full form of the lugs, what a survivor this yellow gold watch truly is. You can even see the dimples beneath the individual indices, signifying that this is actually a generation one dial, which had apertures in the dial into which the feet beneath the indices were inserted. Inside the screwed down case back, Patek Philippe's caliber 12680, 30 joules, Breguet over coil hairspring, free sprung gyro max balance, beaten away at the quirky and vintagey 19,800 vibration per hour beat rate. It was six millimeters thick, that's the 600 part, 12 French lean, that's the 12 part, or 27 millimeters in diameter. Geneva Hallmark signed, it was one of the finest automatics ever crafted in its day state of the art, and you can see on the dial side, still a piece of fine art. 600 of these made, or thereabouts, between 1953 and 1960. This is a special watch, and it may already be sold. So if you're interested, give Josh or George a call. Well, let's see. We've got two different ways to go big and boisterous tonight. We may as well start with the predictable. Hublot. The IT watch of the 2000s, shockingly more relevant than ever in the 2010s, the juggernaut that never seems to lose momentum. Hublot has a way of reinventing itself that would put Madonna and Cher to shame. Now, I have to say part of the formula is just objectively executing attractive and well-engineered watches. In the era of Hublot, the manufacturer, the Unico caliber is impressive. Now, this one has the flyback functionality that is germane to all Unicos. But what I really want to emphasize, and if we can get close, I'll show you precisely what I mean, is that the Unico is executed as an inside-out chronograph. Features like the column wheel and the clutch that would normally be on the, the front side or the, the case back of a movement, on the Unico, you actually see them front and center. So you get all the benefits of a display case back, the column wheel and the beauty of the lateral clutch, but you get it on the dial side of the watch. You also get the robust king gold almost red colored gold with matching indices and hands. Plus, I should mention that the Unico is also a flyback. Manufacturer movement with a three day power reserve, automatic winding, 100 meters water resistant, 38 joules with a free, well, it actually has a micro adjustment mechanism that effectively acts as a free sprung balance because the fine adjustment is fixed in place and a full balance bridge for shock resistant. It has a silicon escapement that is unlubricated and operates with high efficiency and long service intervals. You may not like the Hublot aesthetic, but you gotta admit they do add value right down to the unique car seatbelt buckle quick change system that allows you to swap out the strap to dress it up or dress it down. This is a watch that is actually quite large, and I'm gonna say right now, even I can wear this 45 and a half millimeter case, and I have a baby wrist of 16 centimeters. So Hublot going big, but physically wearable, ergonomically it works, is the look for you only your conscience can say for sure. That said, if you wanna go no nonsense and oversized, Zinn of Germany has got your number. Okay, I can see right here, we got some more Grail watches coming in. Uh, Abu Sadiq saying that Nautilus is gorgeous. 
Ellie Nicola saying Patek Philippe 5990. It is a chronograph and a dual time Nautilus, a big, bold sports watch from Patek. But speaking of big and bold, without being ostentatious, you still want style, but you don't necessarily want the, shall we say, the Hublot baggage. And there is Hublot baggage. If you're not that flamboyant type, but you like your classical large tool watches for the sake of legibility, I have Zinn. And I have an EZM5. This is the U2, as Zinn likes to boast, made of U-boat steel, tank tough, 2,000 meters water resistant. It features a tegumented steel case with a black DLC. The combination of the two making the watch extremely difficult to scratch because typically when you see a scratch on a PVD watch, it's because the surface underneath the DLC coating, if it's DLC, was so soft that it compressed and allowed the coating to crack. Not so here. You can see this one's robustly scratch resistant in as much as it is a pre-owned watch and there's nearly a mark on it. You'll also note that the dial is big, broad, robustly loomed and gives you a second time zone. So the EZM series or mission timer, robustly water resistant, robustly legible with an everyday friendly complication like a dual time. You'll also note the AR symbol on the dial. Although that stands for argon on the periodic table, what it represents is actually a nitrogen fill within the case using special seals to prevent the seep of moisture and oxygen and air into the case to prevent oxidizing. That's what the AR symbol on the dial represents. 44 millimeters, black DLC with tegumented stainless steel underneath. As they like to say in Sin at, well, their Frankfurt am Main factory, it is effectively a U-boat for the wrist. And I may as well show you this U-boat on the wrist. Okay. As you can see, like the Hublot, the style is gonna be big, but it's a no-nonsense watch. Why? Well, so you can see, bigger hands and a bigger dial give you that. A bigger rotating bezel gives you that. High contrast white on black print gives you that. The fact that the watch is all blacked out, well, you can call it tactical, I just call it high style. It's a taste, you either have it or you don't. This is the Zen EZM5, the U2S for Schwarz, or black in German. This is one that you can pick up for, well, the price of a few nice Hublot straps, and frankly, it's just as tough. In fact, I would even say it's quite a good deal more so. Can we focus on that one, guys? There we go, perfect. Let's go out with a bang, and let's go out with a watch that's a grail by any measure, and my all-time favorite Rolex GMT, Hachi Zenki, one of our regular viewers, said that his grail watch would be a Rolex Pepsi, well, not Pepsi, but nipple, it was a nipple dial GMT with a root beer, I'm confusing my soft drinks, with a root beer bezel. Well, let's go Pepsi for a moment, and let's go back to 2014, when the first ever Cerachrom ceramic bezel Pepsi debuted. That's right, this is the Bleu et Rouge, the 116719 in white gold. A $40,000 white gold Rolex GMT Master II. This was the beginning of the ceramic bezel GMT Master. And I have to say, as of 2018, it's also a discontinued watch, as it's been supplanted in the catalog by the blue-dialed equivalent. So the same watch with a blue dial, this with perhaps the more enduring and versatile black dial, is now a much sought and rare collectible piece. Now these were, these were scarcely purchased, and very few dealers held them in inventory because of the price of buying them. So these are watches you hardly ever see, but they have a wonderful stealth wealth factor with the white gold, incredible heft in the hand thanks to the mass of the precious metal with the gloss of the black dial and the blue and the red serochrome to match. This is a watch that has the same event ambiance on the wrist as the Hublot, but does it with grace, proportion, and heritage. This would be my choice between the two, and you don't have to convince me. Guys, thank you so much for joining our Watches Live audience around the world. Remember, enter, link in the description to win our Bird Vallee Horological Sculpture. This is the last week. We're gonna announce a winner next week, so you guys gotta throw your names in the hat, and once you follow the link, participate in our social media, you can actually weight your chances of winning in favor of uh, a victory. So whether you're located abroad or domestically in these United States, you can win. International winners, you are absolutely eligible. If you've already entered, you're already in, but I would still appreciate if you like and subscribe to my own social media properties. Follow me when the fun ends here, Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. I'm Tim, this is Watches Live, this is Watchbox Reviews, and thanks for logging on.